Welcome to Business Unleashed, a Plano Chamber podcast, where we explore the latest insights and strategies to empower your business. In today's episode, we're diving into cybersecurity with our special guest, Nate Howe, the Chief Information Security Officer for the University of Texas at Dallas. Join us as we unravel the importance of cybersecurity for small businesses, talk through our cybersecurity checklist and our future guide to come, designed to fortify your defenses against cybersecurity threats. Let's get into today's episode. <clears throat> okay. Welcome to Business Unleash, a Plano Chamber podcast. In today's episode, we're diving deep into the world of cybersecurity with our special guest, Nate Howe, who serves as the Chief Information Security Officer for the University of Texas at Dallas. So we're excited for Nate to join us as we explore the newly created cybersecurity checklist um, that we've tailored specifically for our small business community. So I'd love to start us off with Nate, introduce yourself to our listeners. Sure. Good morning, Heather. Thanks for having me. Um, over at UT Dallas, I am the Chief Information Security Officer, and I also have a dual role, and that is of adjunct professor, which is um, something I really enjoy, being able to work with our students and uh, uh, teach them and help prepare them uh, in terms of uh, actually joining the cybersecurity fight that we face. I've been in this industry for over 20 years, and uh, during that time focused on a number of things from uh, helping companies and universities achieve compliance with requirements for security and really manage the risks. And during that time, we've seen it is a more risky environment. The cyber crime is on the rise. The cost of that is uh, more and more impactful to, to both small businesses and, and large ones. And um, at UT Dallas, I've been in the security uh, r responsibility, the, the CISO role, uh, now just celebrating uh, 10 years in that position. And so during that 10 years, uh, we've, we've been able to see uh, some of those, those really positive changes we've been able to make, um, opening good dialogue within the university of uh, where do we have risks? What can we do to manage those risks? And really, I always say UTD has a lot of good reasons that we should be in the news. And I don't want to be in the news for having cyber incident. That would be a bad reason to be in the news. And so, um, yeah, with that, uh, I'll, I'll kind of um, see where the conversation goes. I'm, I'm not sure exactly, um, you know, what you want to know about me, but I, I hope uh, through the conversation, you'll see that uh, the partnership that we have with the chamber uh, is a is a really strong one and a growing one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Nate. And, and as you mentioned, we do have a great relationship with UTD. Um, one of your team members serves on our board and has for some time been involved and um, supports our public policy and advocacy efforts, um, as well as just some, some leadership Plano graduates. Um, one is in my class and will be graduating here soon. But um, we, we appreciate UGD's partnership, um, as well as you partnering with us. So for some context for our listeners, we came to Nate and the UTD team. It's probably, maybe it was about a year ago now. Maybe we're not quite at the year mark, but we, we had this idea, um, that we wanted to create a cybersecurity guide or resource for our small business community our small business members in particular, because we understood, as Nate mentioned, it's a very prevalent occurrence. And if there's anything that we can do to add value to our small businesses and their running of their business, we were excited about it. So thankfully, we had this big picture idea and Nate and, his, and, and the folks at UTD said, yeah, we, we would love to partner with you guys on this and actually make that big idea come to life. So Nate, if you would describe essentially like your thought process in creating that cybersecurity checklist, because we'll link that in our episode notes and just the reason why you are so passionate about it and why you think it's so important for small businesses. Sure. So uh, UT Dallas is a member of the chamber and we're also a member of the community and we want to see the community do well around us. And I think, um, you know, it really begins with the educational mission of the university and myself and, and my value system, I always approach the work as educator first. Uh, I don't meet people who wanna have 
a security incident occur, but they often don't know what they can do toward preventing that. It's just a, a matter of not having as much experience with it as some others. And when we heard there was a, a desire to do some outreach to the community and help uh, businesses of all size and organizations around us um, get better at security, we jumped at the chance to be a part of that conversation. What I've observed over the course of time uh, working in this field is um, people who do security work are very details oriented and uh, tend to um, often, you know, uh, uh, focus on a, uh, a large body of knowledge, uh, all those details that go into um, security. And sometimes it becomes a, a bit of an engineering discussion best conducted between engineers. And that effect has led to what we see is over a thousand recommendations. If we look to government and we look to the thought leaders in terms of what they've published as the recommendations, and they say, if you would do these thousand or more steps, then that would be security. And that is a challenge for me when speaking to audiences who don't have as much experience with that topic. We all agree that we don't want incidents. We all agree that we want to protect our customers. But where do you start when it looks like such a large challenge? And so my goal was to really start that conversation somewhere with the topics that most would find approachable and that we could put into use at even the smallest sole proprietorship or small business. And, uh, you know, if you find that interesting and you want to keep going from there, there's always going to be some more we can do. Uh, with information security, it's become that complex, uh, but we don't want to ever start, you know, start with that, that list of a thousand things. It's, it's too overwhelming and, and it becomes an unproductive conversation to tell someone to go do all of that. Um, with that, we, we approach the list as, um, something that we could, we could simply have a conversation with any business owner or member of an organization that was interested in getting started. And we focused around a number of core groups, uh, core topics um, without getting too technical. And the reason we, we didn't wanna to get too technical, I make the case often, security is much more than an IT challenge. Or it, think of it more as a business goal or business imperative to protect what we do, to serve those that we serve, to be resilient as organizations. And that spans more than just IT. And so we developed groupings like, what do we do with our people? How do we educate the people in our organization? Let's not forget about physical security. Even physical security matters to protecting our information. We definitely talk about some of the IT, and that's gonna be part of it. Um, we talk about how to be resilient as an organization, and that is both backing up your data, for example, and having plans if you have a disruption, but it also involves how we responded to things like remote work in mm -hmm. the COVID disruption a few years ago. And so thinking about that in, in terms of how we're going to operate if we have a disruption. And then we also include cloud. When we talk about mm -hmm. cloud, we say, well, what is that? That is... IT, but we don't have to own that IT. We can just use it and benefit from it. And when we started this effort a year ago, we were going to include cloud and encourage the um, safe use of cloud. And uh, just a year later, we're talking about AI. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, in my mind, very much related because a lot of those cloud services are going to build AI functionality into those. But this is how rapidly things change where we weren't talking about generative AI a year ago, uh, suddenly that needs to be included. And so um, uh, I think the framework that we've, we've uh, captured and that we're gonna be sharing with uh, members is a perfect starting point uh, to build a foundation and get the organization thinking about those risks. And uh, there's, there's certainly more beyond that that, that uh, organizations will eventually step into as they get more experience with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll stop there. That's perfect. And I think you're you're nailing the the point that we wanted to kind of make to our members as well with 
the fact that this will just continue to change in the fact that, you know, the, since the, we've started the conversation, just how much the conversation has changed when it comes to things that you added to the mix, like generative AI. So all great, great points. Um, and I know that we are looking forward to kind of slowly rolling this out on our, our social media accounts as well. But for our listeners, you're able to go ahead and actually just download this checklist that we're talking about right now um, at planochamber.org backslash cybersecurity. Um, and we've, Nate has done a wonderful job as far as he has really spotlighted very specific, like manageable, as he mentioned, digestible chunks of information so that our folks that are not necessarily tech savvy or have any sort of background in cybersecurity. Um, it's easily understandable. It, it's it's quick, easy steps that you can start to take and, and share that checklist with your employees. Um, and so we appreciate all that time that you spent on it, really how you how you view that information and you've been in tune really with the community and, and a part of some of those small businesses here kind of in the Richardson Plano area when it comes to cybersecurity and, and education. Um, if you're comfortable, I know uh, an exciting part for us that we were hoping to continue to find ways to support and find some ways for our small businesses to continue their education. You mentioned you're an adjunct professor and that your students, um, when available, instead of doing a final exam, you, you have kind of given them the charge of going out to find a small business. Hopefully someone that is locally owned um, can make the decisions that would allow your students to get some real hand experience as uh, as they're you know working towards their degrees to do a free cybersecurity assessment. And I wondered if you'd be able to share a bit more of you know how that idea came about and maybe some examples of of things that your students have done in the past. Not needing to name businesses or anything, of course, but just the the impact you've seen that have on your students. Sure, uh, I'd like to talk about that program, and I'd also like to just stand back and, and comment that uh, solving these problems definitely creates an opportunity to get uh, advice and, mm -hmm. and consultation from uh, experts who practice uh, the, the information security risk management field. And so uh, as part of the guidance in, in the framework and, and the advice that we would give to any member of the chamber is um, you're not going to know everything you need to know. And, and that's true of everything we do. That's true of our, our um, you know, balancing our, our finances as well. We, we, we look to the experts to help us with things. And uh, we're seeing that, that the leading practices for information security are to get consultation. And so that comes in the form of having an attorney to help advise on what mm -hmm. compliance requirements you might have. Uh, that comes in the form of talking to insurance uh, brokers about insurance that's available to help protect you uh, in case you have an incident and help you recover from that incident. And that we also have consultation for uh, identifying risks and developing a roadmap for improving security. And there's a lot of companies that can help with that. Some of them are actually members of the chamber and um, they have a cost, right? I mean, certainly, um, uh, these types of services are in demand and they're related to preventing incidents that can be extremely expensive. So um, as such, we would expect there's gonna be a cost to these services. And so we got to thinking, uh, what might we be able to do that would be a lower cost or no cost option uh, to small businesses and organizations in the community and also a win-win for some of the students that we're educating at UTD. At UTD, where I do the adjunct teaching with uh, our business school and our political science school, we um, have an opportunity, and we've done this in semesters past, to integrate the performance of a risk assessment into the classwork. I've made this a, a semester long final project, if you will. And during those semesters that we do the project, the students actually become junior consultants. And mm -hmm. so it's, very much a learning experience for them, but it's a learning experience for the businesses that volunteered to welcome those students in and have a conversation with them in a free assessment. Mm -hmm. We don't use the names of the companies. We, you know, keep all that information private. There's no, um, uh, you know, moment of 
of those organizations being exposed to any extra uh, security risk by having participated. Uh, but the students really see the classroom lessons come to life. And so we've had students go out and visit with uh, all kinds of small businesses from uh, real estate firms, dentist office, restaurants, dry cleaners. Sometimes in the past, those connections were made through family connections, um, uh, alumni of the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the challenge we've run into at this point is, is just scaling that program to as many willing businesses that would be able to accommodate our risk assessment teams. And so when we do this work, we don't touch your network, we don't get on your computers. It's more of a conversation. It's more of an interview approach. Um, but, but this results in a final project where the students um, then as a, as a team of consultants uh, present their findings in class and uh, make their recommendations. And those recommendations are there, then shared back to the, to the client. In this case, the, you know, that participating company becomes a client of ours. So, so we run this in the fall and the spring. So that's when I have classes in the fall and the spring. And uh, we're always receptive to interested businesses. Uh, and and uh, as I said, UTD is preparing students to join this cybersecurity challenge that we all face. Uh, the research tells us that there's actually a talent shortage finding people prepared to help with cybersecurity problems. I've seen numbers ranging from a million to four million uh, unfilled positions to work on cyber. And so UTD is both uh, trying to prepare students for that, uh, to help with those problems on both a local and national basis. And it's also a great career opportunity for those students. We're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of students who work on these problems who are able to find job placement coming right out of college. Which is huge. I know when we first met Nate, we we discussed that opportunity a lot because um, I think it was it's a great opportunity to advertise to our small businesses and members of the chamber because I think again they're giving back to students, they're they're giving back to what we're all feeling, which is the workforce shortage, as well as having you know the free assessment and 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 I think you clarifying that it's more of the interview style, not necessarily like getting into the nitty gritty of of your computers or, or systems would make our people feel better because I, I think I think some of that apprehension in the past has just been that they're they're not sure if it's if it's going to cause them more problems or if, if they're going to expose themselves. So that is great clarification. Yeah, absolutely. We we always need to start these conversations by knowing the risks that we have and the assets that we want to protect. And and I would say to the smallest business, don't let the financial side of that scare you away from making progress. Risk assessments begin with a conversation and these solutions begin with talking to our people, consulting mm -hmm. with each other and with those who have experienced incidents in your network. Talk to them and, and, and see what they can tell you about the incidents that they've experienced. And when we start to talk about assessing our risks, making a list of what we want to protect, uh, there's free resources. Um, uh, you know, you could you could chat with the university and see if we might do something together. Um, but there's other resources in the public domain, mm -hmm. and 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 I see organizations could be well equipped to get started with this if they're taking it seriously, if they're interested in it. UT Dallas is the best overall university in North Texas by Forbes, based on graduates' academic success, salaries after graduation low student debt, and more. UTD also ranks number five for most national merit scholars in the country. Surprised? With strong programs in business, engineering, and computer science, as well as innovative research, UT Dallas is a university on the rise. Find out more at utdallas.edu slash discover UTD. Well, Nate, we appreciate that feedback too. And again, the clarifications for our small businesses and our members of the Plano Chamber to, to find ways to hopefully get more involved with that class project. Um, and I know kind of earlier in the conversation, we discussed how much has just changed, right? When it comes to AI and the threats that that brings with it. Um, I am personally not an expert in that. So I would love to just know more from you as a thought leader on that. Like, what is it you're seeing or maybe what do our members need to be more cognizant of as this technology continues 
to change? Sure. Well, I'm glad you you admitted to not being an expert. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm also not an expert, and I don't think anybody is an expert right now True. because it has changed so quickly. And and AI and generative AI has has reached the point where we can all interface with it and benefit in some way. Uh, we, we've experienced things like the chat GPT service or generating images that never existed before. And where it goes from here is really challenging the imagination. Uh, AI has been concept and, and it's been in, in uh, a lot of IT behind the scenes for years, but we're now just reaching a point where we've realized the technology is so good. We're going to be using this to improve productivity in ways that we're just now beginning to see. And so with that is, is the opportunity, but also the, the risks of that. Uh, I was at a, a conference and, and a colleague presented this, this idea. It was um, whoever invented the train also caused mm -hmm. the first train collision, you know, or, sure. or train crash, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it was really making the point that the technology is not good or bad. It's what we're going to do with it. You know, that, that um, innovations and changes can really create new opportunities, new experiences, and, and can be very beneficial, uh, but sometimes have those adverse, unexpected kind of side effects. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to generative AI, when it comes to this concept of um, interacting with computers in a more natural way, where it seems like they better understand language, where they can create and where they can convincingly uh, interact with us in our work. And, and uh, we're probably going to look back on this time and, and think of it as, as a moment such as when the agricultural economy went to the manufacturing economy or when we mm -hmm. went from without internet to now having internet mm -hmm. and the next generation grows up and, and doesn't know life without the internet. Well, this is now going to be the way we interact with computing going forward. And it's going to um, really enable us on a productivity basis to work more efficiently, to have mm -hmm. a, a writing partner, to have a, a creative partner, in the computer with us and um you know this is this is all causing people to rush into it and start using it right away True. the challenge that we see is when those services are free no cost public services we should ask why they're free and the reason they're free is because they've turned us all into testers mm. the more that we use those services okay. we're helping improve those services and that could be fun and interesting to a point, but we also see some cases where companies have employees who are putting company information into a free service. Mm -hmm. And once it goes in, it doesn't come back out. Mm -hmm. And so Which is a little scary. You know, at, at, the, at the university as well, we always say, if we provide storage, then you should use that storage because we've contracted for it and we've made sure it's compliant. We wouldn't expect people to bring their own storage options to the workplace because those would be more risky and, and we'd have less ability to support those. And so very quickly, the AI products, the um, chat GPT type services are finding their way into the day-to-day -day work of the business. And, and this is the part where I would encourage a conversation with all the employees, all the members of the team to say, uh, though you know, that, that may be something you're tempted to use at work. What's expected? Do we expect you to yeah. use that or not? What care do we expect you to provide to the information of our business? Uh, we're certainly seeing big challenges in medical environments. We can't be putting mm -hmm. patient information into those, into those tools. Um, uh, and, and again, this is, this is happening so quickly. Um, uh, when they survey employees of, of businesses who, who say they're already using it, yet the leadership, the the directors, the the board, uh, they've yet to even devise a policy around this. Uh, so we're all going to be playing catch up a bit. Uh, but but a key point here is that which you put into these AI services, really, we have to assume it can't be easily deleted, because as that new information gets integrated, that is how the AI improves. And so, mm -hmm. um, this is, this is, um,
creating a, a really challenging situation um, that, that I think um, is going to show up in places you didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. We're seeing in the marketplace, all those cloud services, everything that we've been using to do our email and balance our books and have a, a website for our business are going to start to include those features mm -hmm. very quickly if they haven't already. So uh, try and build awareness around that and, and uh, talk to your team about what they're putting into those. That was the best way I've heard, like, just essentially just described, like, with caution, like, it is free and that seems like a great, a great draw to try it out and maybe use it as a brainstorming or, you know, shortcut or whatever it is. But you're right. They essentially just turned us all into their worldwide testers to see how this works. And I've, I've you know, heard some of the scarier stories of, I don't want to say scary, but just the cautionary tales of, you know, since there's not, like you mentioned, a lot of processes or policies already around it because we're learning it there's going to be a lot of hiccups and a lot of things that are unfortunately probably going to set the precedent for maybe how not to use it or just the, the best way to use it to ensure you're, you're keeping all of your intellectual property as safe, right? As possible. Exactly. So, very exactly. And, and there are other options. So for example, okay. the university works with Microsoft and Microsoft mm -hmm. is one of the providers mm -hmm. of similar AI tools, but if it's used in a paid model, then one of the benefits of paying them for that version is that it's isolated to just your organization and what you put mm -hmm. into it is not spread back to the public offering. And so we're looking at that as a suitable option so that we can use something at the university, yet it's got, it's got some boundaries, you know, it's got some, some uh, uh, management tools and, and limitations. So we would not be, putting our students or, or other types of information at risk. And, uh, you know, that, that is just one solution, but, but sometimes organizations will look at paying for something mm -hmm. because that brings with it that higher degree of control. So these are the sure. choices. These are the choices that, that the board and the, the executives will be struggling with. Yes, <laughs> very true. I think, Again, in that your like example too of you know the one the the individuals that created or engineered the trains and the the train track system like there is also going to be the errors that come from that because this new technology has been created so it'll be interesting to to kind of keep revisiting this checklist and and our goal at the chamber is that this is something that we can it's a living document if you will like we have our latest our first version out right now and we hope to continue updating it because it's going to keep changing. There's going to be new threats. Unfortunately, maybe those bad guys are, are going to continue to also figure out ways around um, security and, and things that we, we, we come up with. So it'll be interesting that, to see what happens in the world of AI. That That's for sure. We, we've seen technologies, again, not good or bad on their own, but it's what us humans do with them. Uh, we've seen Things like cloud technology. Cloud technology offered mm -hmm. a lot of capacity, flexibility, seasonality to businesses. So you could just subscribe to the, the computing needs that you had and make adjustments as your needs change. And so we've seen the criminals do the same thing. They went to the cloud mm -hmm. and they could obtain more computer capacity without having to buy it. And so it would help right. them do other types of attacks. And now what we're seeing is, for example, um, uh, in the old days, we would say, in your phishing scam emails, look for grammatical errors, look for language errors, mm -hmm. and those may be a, a, a signal to you that that's not a genuine email. But if your adversary is using AI to write a better scam, and it's a more convincing mail, then people are going to be more likely to fall for it. So mm -hmm. we're seeing the use of AI both empower the attacks to be more convincing, and then we're also implementing... AI-based tools to do better analysis on those attacks. And so it's something of a back and forth or an arms race in this industry uh, where, where the technology is used on both sides. Very true. And, and we, you're kind of alluding to it, but can you maybe go into more detail for some of our folks, again, listeners of all array of sizes of business and even some of our educational partners, what maybe examples of what you all are doing at UTD and maybe things you've seen in your past are like best practices when it comes to training and just keeping your folks as up to date and, 
and almost like on your on their toes with with the things that you're mentioning, like those those phishing scans, like just how they're trying how the bad guys are essentially trying to get smarter. But what do you what have you seen are some good best practices when it comes to training your employees? Sure. So so the conventional wisdom is you do have to train the employees. And I, I will never make the case not to do training of employees. But I think we also struggle with whether employees will be able to pick up on these scams and these these cyber attacks to the level that they would need to do to help us defend, to help us mm -hmm. protect. And so there's some things that we definitely want to try to teach them. One of the things I, I point out is um, good customer service is not just being fast, but it's also mm -hmm. showing care to your customer's information. We've run into this just working on our own processes, making sure that in the university, the work of the university can be done quickly and efficiently, but not to that point that we ignore sometimes something doesn't feel right. And if it doesn't feel right, there may be a good reason for that, that, that built-in sense that, that we all have when something feels like it might be a scam. And if you get suspicious, we encourage people to pause and talk to a colleague talk to a supervisor and recognize that's part of good service. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, maybe medical industry kind of gets this right when they say do no harm, kind of that mm -hmm. uh, Hippocratic oath. Mm -hmm. And so, so we want to, to realize that people are counting on us. We've been entrusted with their information in our different industries and, and what are they expecting, right? How, how would right. I want to see my mom or my family be treated by the businesses they use? And so, um, uh, that is a lesson I think everybody can pick up on. We can reinforce mm -hmm. that customer service isn't just speed, but it's also care. Um, we have seen organizations do things like simulating an incident to get people mm -hmm. together in a room, talk about what would happen if, what if the systems were down? What if we were fighting viruses on our computers? What would, what would happen next? Mm -hmm. Um, what if our facility couldn't open and we had to work remotely, what would we do next? And, and so that's a type of education that's very good is, is, is doing some exercises and talking about scenarios. And then we also think of what, what all the um, marketing execs, executives, marketing experts would tell us, which is you need to make multiple impressions on a topic. Mm. You can't just do security training once a year, call it done and think that that's going to make a difference. True. People will, be more likely to succeed with short, repeated messages on security topics. Think of it maybe more as monthly or, mm -hmm. or multiple formats, something in the break room, an email, you know, conversation at a meeting, make those multiple impressions over time. And, and so uh, this is all speaking to in, employees or team members that we have access to. Right. But then we also should think about our stakeholders outside be they customers or donors, what do they need to know? Both about the kind of organization that you are and, and your values for protecting their information, but also them doing their part. So uh, for example, if, if there's a, a need to do two-factor authentication and use their mobile phone, educate them while you're doing that so it's not an inconvenience to them, but they recognize that, that they're actually participating in their own security. I'm taking notes as you're saying all of this, because I think to kind of hone in on that point of repetition, I think it, at least in previous positions too, I think that was probably the norm of it's maybe your once a year training that you really just need to check off and, and show that you did it and you participated in it. But um, I think I've made the comment to our other folks involved with our cybersecurity checklist that uh, truly there, it might be every other day, someone is Kelly Marcellus, who is not really like our boss, like think, wants us to help them in, in an immediate fashion. So just being on your toes and, and that point of repetition, our hope is that we continue the conversation kind of year round when it comes to this new resource, especially the checklist. We'll, we're, we're planning to not repurpose it necessarily, but maybe just break it up into manageable chunks, like you mentioned, where we're sharing it. It's a continual thing people are used to seeing. So again, it just becomes more of a second nature to them. It's a second nature to their team. And then I like the way that you said, you know, that, that, importance of your stakeholders and customers as well, right? Because uh, the unfortunate part will be if, you know, customers information is breached or, or leaked, and then how do you come back from that type of scenario? 
that we've seen as well. So all very good notes. I've taken, I've taken lots of good notes. As we kind of wrap up though, Nate, I'd love to know a bit more about what UTD is doing right now to, to kind of further the education, even outside of this checklist, right? Like I know, I know you guys do a lot in the community and I'd love to just know more about what you guys are doing and maybe where folks can find more information on that. Sure. So being a university, we think of three main activities of the university, the teaching mission, the research mission, and then the administrative support of the university. Uh, in my work, I'm part of two of those. I'm in the teaching side as well as the administration side. Teaching, we have numerous degrees for people interested in studying cybersecurity, ranging from the programming side to the managing of cybersecurity to setting policy and people who are going into government relations and, and um, um, legal roles and privacy roles around this, this topic. Um, undergrads and graduates and, and uh, really preparing the next generation of people to enter this field and help with these problems. On the research side, our Office of Research and Innovation has numerous partnerships with businesses where researchers are helping them solve security problems and it's mutually mm -hmm. beneficial to both help those partner organizations, but then our researchers also get access to some of the, the latest attacks and techniques that are coming up on real networks so that we can see what's happening out there in the world and then learn from it. And so uh, I think there's opportunities in, in both of those areas for people looking to study. And uh, in terms of if I'm an employer and I have a need to hire great candidates into numerous types of positions, not just security, mm -hmm. but the, the, the engineers and the business people and such that we're uh, producing as our graduates, these are great candidates to consider for jobs in the community and for internship opportunities. UTD mm -hmm. has, has um, you know, continued to rise in the ranks and, and really establish ourselves as a, a leading university in the region. And I, I think that's mutually beneficial to the region. And, and it's, um, you know, it's a really good story to tell if you get to know UTD. Mm -hmm. On the administrative side, where we also do security to protect the university itself. Uh, my office, the Information Security Office, our website, infosecurity.utdallas.edu. We have some open web pages, blog entries that people are welcome to read, um, though they're mostly targeted at our, our university audience. Mm -hmm. um, they, they could be interesting to any industry. You know, some of our best practices to teach telecommuters how to do that safely, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, when when we did more remote work during the COVID-19 response, uh, we were we were educating remote workers and, and protecting them even when they were outside the arms of the campus network. Right. And so um, overall we just you know want to see the community be successful and and uh, I think a lot of a lot of good things are happening with cyber in particular. Thank you for sharing that. I think that will definitely become a a good, a, another good resource for our small business owners. And I mean, I think you mentioned it being more aimed towards your university audience, but I think we've got a lot of folks that would definitely see themselves as some lifelong learners. So would definitely love to see what it is that you guys are doing so that we can continue to learn from it. Um, and I just wanted to thank you again for saying yes about a year ago to helping us start this brand new kind of series, if you will, of, of resources and, and information. So Again, for our folks, if you are interested in downloading the newest and latest and greatest cybersecurity checklist that we've done in collaboration with UTD, you'll be able to find that on planochamber.org backslash, backslash cybersecurity. And we'll, we'll be sharing this on our socials. We'll, we'll be sharing it and including the link to download it. So it is something that is meant to share and print with your team members. Um, but again, we, we thank you, Nate, for taking time out today. And, and the continued awareness and education that you're offering to us and our members. And we will see you all and you'll hear from us next time. And that wraps up another enlightening episode of Business Unleashed, a Plano Chamber podcast. We hope you found this deep dive into cybersecurity both informative and actionable. A thank you to Nate Howe for sharing his expertise with us today. And a huge thank you to UTD for sponsoring our cybersecurity guide and this episode. 
Remember, safeguarding your business against cybersecurity threats is an ongoing journey, and education is key. For more information and resources on cybersecurity, visit our website at planochamber.org backslash cybersecurity. Don't forget to subscribe to Business Unleashed on your preferred podcast platform for more insights and inspiration to unleash your business potential. Until next time, stay safe and stay secure.